if someone submits credentials, then those credentials are now completely compromised, right? Like, it's going to... If that's the except, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I was saying, yes, that is an exception. It's like, I mean, they have to be able to respond to those things. But as long as you, but do you put something in the contract that they should not be penalized for these results, that they should be educated on them, not harmed? Um, that would be a question for my employer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I await that answer. Yeah. I mean, look, to, to put something in the contract that you have with the target organization that says, you know, you're not going to penalize them, the employees, that might be a difficult negotiation point because they want it to be up to them what they do, right? But on the other hand, though, to your point, though, Jason, about educating the employees, one thing, most of the, the organizations that are going to be going through these types of exercises are larger organizations with bigger budgets that can afford it, right? So part of what they are getting better at doing, and they're not great about it, is but when you onboard a new employee, you put this kind of stuff in the employee handbook and you let them know you're responsible for these assets. These assets need to be properly managed. We run penetration testing scenarios. We, you might be social engineered. You can put all of this in the employee handbook. And I frankly think that they should because then they're on notice that there might be some test at any particular moment. It might be a fish. It might be a phone call. It might be something, and they might be named in some kind of report. And I think that's the exception. But the, the other thing I would say is if there are really egregious employees, what you might want to do is orally, again, communicate who those people are without putting it in writing and then put those remedial measures, the things that Jason had mentioned and Grifter had mentioned, either sandboxing or you know, some additional email filtering, more help at the email gateway for these, these you know, people. Uh, that might be part of the report that you put together. But I think when it comes to the duty of care, JC, which is, you know, sometimes these acts are so egregious that you might think it could cross over into intentionality. And there's a big difference between somebody, an employee who's negligent and somebody who is intentionally crossing the lines. There, I would think that, you know, you might have an insider threat problem at that particular moment if somebody is, is that bad or that negligent, grossly negligent. And then I think it's, it would be within the bounds of due care to name that person. But again, that would be an exception. Excellent. Thank you. And then Corgi, with uh, work from home resulting from COVID, how everybody works from home now, we've ditched the office. Now employees, especially with the start of the pandemic and the assets not being available, they were encouraged to use their own personal devices, own personal computers. A lot of employers are still doing that. Knowing that we have the work from home situation, employees might be on personal devices. How do we feel from an ethical or moral standpoint of engaging with those employees where we might be touching home devices now? Yeah, um, so that's just something that I wouldn't really do. Um, you know, when we're conducting tests like this and regarding social engineering, we're pulling like a lot of system information with that kind of stuff. So if you're conducting a phishing campaign, you're getting like, the user's domain, you know, in addition to everything else that you're doing, their username, stuff like that. Um, so you would be able to recognize very quickly whether or not it's a home device or a work device. And we just wouldn't continue an escalation on a device that someone owns. Neil or Jason, would you go the opposite direction knowing that that's the working environment now? Yeah, I think um, as we saw our networks expand into users' homes and, and what that meant for security, I mean, uh, I mean, it really turned things on its head. Like, I mean, in one regard, it was nice because it, it forced the ability to like to transition into a, a state that allowed for that type of work, which I think, it, you know, was better for all of our mental health at, at a certain point, right? It's just being able to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to work from home today. Um, but it, you saw immediately the hockey stick level of phishing attacks, things that, that did target home users. Right. Um, and so I think if you're leaving those devices out, you're doing a disservice to the company. I know, but if, if I'm an attacker, I don't care that that's your home machine. Um, if, if I had to put a limit somewhere, I would say, okay, well, I want to be able to say that I got access and then I was able to reach a certain level of access in that machine, but I'm not like, I would draw the line. I'd say it like exfiltration. You're not going to take anything that's personal data or anything like that. I kissed you. You can even cough on me. <laughs> Being considerate. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just think that you, you do have to like the scope should include those things because the attacker includes those things. As a matter of fact, they count on those things. 
uh, but the the data that you remove from that environment should have some kind of guardrails around it. And that's a good point. And let's move that over to Alex with allowing an employer to in scope your home personal devices. How practically legal is that? It that's a gray area. It definitely is. I mean, because if you think about it, you only can authorize some kind of test on an asset that you own. I couldn't authorize as much as I would love to JC, somebody to perform a penetration test on your home network. You know, I'm sure it would be interesting. All the things. You oh my God. Yeah. I can only imagine all the television the video the doors things, open, you know, that's, uh, yeah. But the, I think it, it really, it would be crossing a line in a sense. I totally agree with Grifter here in that, you know, that would emulate a real world attack because, you know, somebody behind a router with three-year-old firmware or longer than that is going to be more susceptible, right? The problem too, though, is there could be liability there. You know, it's, it's a lower risk, but if you compromise an asset and it couldn't technically be within the legal authority of, let's say the employee's company to give you the right to access their home network or home devices, personal devices, et cetera, and you do some fuzzing, there's some kind of denial of service or something is taken out, you destroy a laptop or whatever, right? You could be subject to a civil lawsuit after that under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The hacking statute also has not just criminal consequences, but a private right of action for somebody to bring a civil case against anyone who uh, intrudes or, or accesses a, another's computer without authorization. Now, the, there's a damages limitation, though. It's $5,000. You have to do $5,000 worth of damages in order to um, uh, be liable, in order for there to be a case that's part of the, the actual claim is the damages component. Um, but we all know you can ring up a $5,000 bill from any kind of DFIR firm really, really quickly. So I think you're right, Grifter, and that it emulates the real world, but you got to be extremely careful about how you go about scoping those engagements and the language that you're using. Awesome. So looking at the, the lens of ethics and morals, uh, I guess Grifter, Jason, or Corgi, is there any personas that you would not impersonate as part of your engagements. It's just completely off the table, whether it's asked for or not. No. <laughs> Good answer next. Yes. All right. And yes. <laughs> uh, you know, if you ask a yes or no question, you get a yes or no answer. That's on me. What do you mind for the yeses? What do you mind elaborating? Um, uh, I, I won't go as the Popo cause they hate me enough as it is. And I got warrants, uh, in several countries. Uh, uh, but hypothetically, that's cool, right? It's like hypothetically, uh, yeah. So, uh, um, wait, yeah. hang on. Can, can Alex actually answer that one? Hypothetically, H hypothetically impersonating the police. Yeah. You should not do that. I'm never going to do it. Well, I'm never going to Paraguay again anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but the, they know what they did. Don't act like they're bad guys. Um, uh, but so, um. I would say it's like, I wouldn't go that, I wouldn't go as a dark, something that would actually emotionally affect someone in a negative way. It's like, I'm never going to tell someone that they want enough money to alter their, their lifestyle or like a hundred bucks. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell them that there's a, and yes, GoDaddy did that. And, uh, yes, I'm not going to tell, I name names. I don't filter. <laughs> Exactly. It's like, trust me, I don't filter. And then I get life. I, I get paid to lie for a living. I don't do it for free. It's like, and, um, and telling people that there's a vaccine available for them to go get that they can sign up to it when there's a middle of a pandemic, which a library did that should be out of because they were, that was horrible. And, uh, and because when you do those things, you may have had one or two insider threats in your company after it's over. You've got a lot more to worry about. It's like, because you just created them. And so, yeah, that's not effective. It's like, you can't do something that is going to do that kind of harm and expect to get away with it. It's like, so no, I'm not going to go in as a character that's going to do something that, that is going to give them relief or cause them trauma if they don't respond. The whole point of an attack is to make them think, uh, react, uh, you know, emotionally instead of think logically, but I do the reacts in demos. I mean, I've done demonstrations of phishing attacks and I do that for security awareness all the time. And I will use the deaths of real people 
It's like to send a phishing email example, not actually sending it to the employees, but I show them how I would find the email address, how I would find out who to target. Then I Google tragic, horrible, terrible. It's like in a, in, in, in from the city that I'm trying to get the message to. And then I use one of those stories because trust me, it's like, that's what the attackers are doing. I got an email uh, two days after the Boston bombing talking about uh, the Boston bombing. It's like, and then the link was just an IP address that said boston.html. But if you have children or family running in that race back then, it's like, if you had someone that was dealing with that and the cell services were horrible, who's not going to click that link? It's like, and criminals know that, and I am not going to play that part of it. I'm not a method actor when it comes to playing the part of the criminal. So, uh, but humans, when they're fear, they want to get information. And so most of those demo emails, I never tell a person to click the link. I just say, I heard about this horrible thing happening. And then this is happening nearby to you. You need to be aware of it. And it's like, and then when you say where I heard about this thing, you just put like a bad link and then it's like, you never tell them to click the link. They're going to click the link. It's like, but that's a demonstration that never goes sent to the internet because you are a horrible person and deserve horrible things if you ever do. Yeah, I think again, you're, um, you're, you're saying, okay, this is something that an attacker is going to do. Gave examples of where attackers did do that. And I yeah. said, it's bad to emulate that. Like, okay, well, well they're going to do it. Right. And so, yes, sir. I guess, I mean, if you're, if I had to draw a line, like if you had to say like, oh yeah, where we like telling somebody their kids are hurt would probably mm -hmm. not be something I would do. Oh, right? so you're re but, tracking no, your no. Say, yeah. I'll take my, I'll make my no. Pretty right much there. no. Pretty much no. Like I would probably not tell somebody that their children were hurt. Right. Um, there's yeah, grandma's what? Yeah. Grandma's are fair game. Grandma <laughs> likes ham. Yeah. Corgi yourself. Um, I can like right on par with Jason. Um, uh, anything like too emotionally drawing is probably pretty off limits, but with a bigger emphasis on like things that are illegal. So like anything related to the government or stuff like that. Like I had an intern, I think a few weeks ago and he was like, Oh, can I make a fake driver's license for this? And I was like, please don't fucking do that. <laughs> <laughs> Have somebody else make it for you. It's so much higher quality. <laughs> That's true. I'm going I'm yep. to record you again now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's cool. Good initiative, bad judgment. <laughs> so um, from, from a moral perspective, having a client that asks you to remove a finding, have we had that? And no. Yeah. I, so I've been in meetings where I start to report, right? We sit down to go through the brief. And as I start to discuss where things have gone wrong, they say, you need to stop talking. It's happened twice. You need to stop talking. And I'm like, what? And they're like, don't say another word. And the reason they're saying that is because guys like him that is right. are Probably. sitting behind them going from the moment I tell them that they have a problem, it's actually the clock starts for them to fix that problem. And I have done hundreds of assessments. Who knows? I don't even, I don't even know how many. I can't count. But twice I have been told, don't say anymore. You can take that with you. You're free to go. Like, so yeah, not just, we don't want to hear about that finding. We don't want to hear anything else. You get paid and you leave and you're like, I hated that. That's not cool at all. But put all that time into that report. Yeah. QA'd I QA'd it and everything. I've had a contractor who literally, they, they put in the scope that I could go into the server room for a defense contractor, you know, just, it was for a defense contractor somewhere in the DC area. We'll say, you're the Pentagon. And, uh, I don't care. It's like, uh, and they told me that they d gave me the scope and it wasn't a very good scope. And I followed the scope and, uh, I ended up in their server room and then like Five minutes after getting in there, the guy runs in and says, dude, you need to get the out now. And I'm like, I can't believe you can't, you're out. It's over. Everything's over. And I was like, you said it was okay, but we didn't think you could get in. I was like, that's not my problem. <laughs> it's like, they'll put findings in thinking that it's like, if you fail, that makes them look better. Not realizing if you succeed, it makes them look worse. 
And literally that whole contract was over. It's like they, that was the end of it. It's like, I had to go back in the next day, uh, talk to all the C's and the O's on, on Mahogany Row and explain to them what was happening. And I didn't get to do a report. I didn't get to do anything. They just said, you're paid, get the out and we will never see you again. Uh, it's like, so I GTFO because I don't know if they could black ban me or not. It's like, interesting. Oh, exactly. I was like, what the, so, so, so that happened. Uh, did, yeah, uh, look, I, fr from the lawyer's perspective here, I feel, I feel like we're on the Please. defense here, you know, but, uh, there are some good reasons why certain things shouldn't be put into reports as well. And there's also a lot of different ways to manage the reporting function as well. So like a good lawyer will ask you to, you know, orally read out the report before you're putting anything in writing. So you know what those contours are. There's going to be no surprises when you get the right people in the room. And there might be some massaging or a good lawyer might say, well, we don't necessarily have direct evidence of what you just said, right? You know, you shouldn't be speculating in some of these reports because that could lead to bad things happening down, down the line, right? So there's also another way that you can manage these reports is to work your engagements through counsel. And a lot of you have probably done this in the past so that to a certain extent, the output of what you're doing, your reports could be legally privileged or protected by the attorney work product doctrine, but then protects the company and allows you to put more, you would be more candid in your reports and you could have a privileged version that the company has with, you know, all of the, the warts and everything on it. And then an unprivileged version that you're going to share with third parties that the test was successful. There's going to be certain remedial measures that we're implementing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of ways to manage it, but, uh, I, I would say, you know, for what you mentioned, Grifter, you probably had a, a really risk averse jerk of a lawyer on the other side of it, whispering in the client's ear. And that, that doesn't benefit anybody. I mean, what's the whole point of that engagement? Sorry. So I have one more question and then we'll turn it over to Q and A. So if you would like to ask questions, I have the question and answer mic right over here between the chairs and the booth. So feel free to start a line right there. But Alex, this uh, last question is directed towards you. And then we can uh, allow the testers to opine. I think the coal fire engagement proved that the get out of jail free card is not really a thing. So with that, uh, one of the things that was important that everyone noticed was that coal fire was the company that did the test, but the two testers were the ones in jail. Yeah. Right. So for our penetration testers that are doing those physical social engineering engagements, what can they do differently or what can they do to work with their company to make sure they don't end up in jail? Or is that just part of the risk of this work? Now it goes back to, you know, full circle of what we started on, right? Which is that this is an, an area where you're always going to be on the edge of legality, right? No, no matter what, there could be a, something could be misinterpreted. Something can go wrong uh, at any moment. And frankly, that's probably why you should be charging more for these types of engagements because there is so much inherent risk there. But let's, you know, the coal fire engagement was from a couple of years ago, but let's go back you know, like 16, 17 years ago, where there was a somewhat similar situation with HP. You know, and HP, I can't remember the name of the chairperson. It, I believe it was a woman. She had a problem with some leakings happening to the media, and she believed that it was happening over at the board level. And so what she did was she got in touch with people in the general counsel's office, general counsel's office of HP, then hired investigators who then pretexted and impersonated certain members of the board to access their telephone records to see who was actually going and talking with the media. And once this got out, well, you know, there were criminal charges against the lawyers involved, against the investigators involved, both at the federal and the state level. Yeah, I think it ultimately ended with community service from a bunch of people pleaded out with community service. But that was another case from, you know, a decade and a half earlier where there were real, real world consequences. And then that led to federal law being passed preventing you from pretexting to obtain telephone records. And I think, you know, you got to be really careful when you're dealing with telephone records and financial records because you have the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act and then this Telephone Records Privacy Protection Act. I can't remember the name of the actual statute, but that's a big problem. But to go back to the coal fire thing, you really have to level set, I think, with the employer and the employee. You have to have, you can have a get out of jail free card. You got to make sure that you have the right contacts on there that it's up to date, that it specifies the date and the time that you're doing this and that you are caught or whatever happens within that particular scope. All of these things have to be really detailed. You want to have at least two contacts 
on that get out of jail free card because one of them is going to be spelunking in Paraguay or something. And inevitably when you get picked up and uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really risky. And I think anything that touches on physical intrusion, especially into, I think like the coal fire engagement, I think it was a courthouse, right? Yeah. That's a little bit crazy, right? I mean, you may also want to give some other, depending upon the risk level here, some third party not notification, even perhaps to like the local police or the, the judiciary itself, that something is going to go down. Um, I know it takes away from the veracity of the emulation, but it also reduces some of the risk. So there are ways to do it. I think, you know, there's a pitch to, to talk with a lawyer first before you do anything that risky. And as someone who talked to the coal fire guys, it's like one thing that, that saved them immensely was get as much, rec uh, your receipts, you know, show the receipts, make sure that you're talking to the employers and the people, your clients and making sure that there is a written record that can, you can go back on because when they find out that the stuff hits the fire, they can go, oh no, we didn't really put that in scope. Oh, we really didn't say that they could do that. You make sure you have the recordings that you have any kind of agreement. It's like verbal or written and you have documentation of it to prove what w went on. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree with that. And just to, to expand on it, I think that is so important. You've got to keep these, these records, anything that's outside the contract and negotiations that you went through. And, and nothing is going to prevent you from getting arrested, right? You know, a cop might pick you up, take you down to the station. You might have a criminal charge pending against you. But at that point, you probably want to make sure, you know, earlier on that you have indemnification provisions in your contract so that, you know, the organization that's the target of your testing, you know, might be on the hook to pay for your legal fees or at least, you know, indemnify you for whatever they are. But if you've got the, the records that Jason's mentioning, that negates that mental element of the crime, there, right? And so you should be able to, to hire a lawyer yeah, and who was going to talk with the local prosecutor and get these charges dismissed because you are going, they are going to have a deficient charge if you don't have that mental element there. Right? You should be able to get this dismissed. But it's stressful and it's risky and you have to be really careful about it. Excellent. First question. Is it still not on? There you go. I think you're on. You just got to be closer. All right. Uh, right. I'll eat the mic real quick. There you go. Um, so, uh, question for Alex. Uh, what's, if there is, what do you think the threshold is for testers um, who come across a uh, critical, uh, like, uh, life threatening vulnerability uh, for whistleblower status? And uh, a second, uh, for testers, um, when you're dealing with, uh, let's say morally questionable clients or you know, people you contract, what's your personal ethical guidelines for dealing with people or determining whether you'll deal with people? Thank All right. you. All right. Sure. So I'll take the, the first part of that. Um, you know, so if you come across something that is absolutely critical, it could be life-threatening and you want to turn this into some kind of whistleblowing situation. I mean, you're doing it at your own peril at that point, right? I mean, the, the organization that you're dealing with might have some kind of tip line or whistleblowing line. Large organizations generally do. I used to be the chief compliance officer of a very big uh, luxury conglomerate and I ran the whistleblowing line for that, the worldwide whistleblowing line. And it was amazing some of the stuff that you would see come in. Some of it was really important, some of it wasn't but all of it has to be investigated. And so that might be one avenue to pursue. There are certain uh, legal protections for whistleblowers, but it might get you in significant hot water if your identity comes out and it, it shows that, you know, it was your, your, for, your employer, you know, that um, is responsible for this big mess that you've now caused this client. So you're doing so at your own peril. I would say to definitely talk to a lawyer before you make any moves. That's, I think, the best advice that I could give because all of this is going to be context-dependent, fact-driven, uh, and it will also depend on the organization. If the organization is in, like, the defense industrial base, there's going to be a lot of ramifications for that particular company. There may be better ways for you to approach it. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, I think the best advice I could say is de definitely talk to a lawyer before you make any moves um, and, and be prepared to be without a paycheck. I can straight out tell you, it's like, uh, I had a, uh, 
a family that used to was raised on uh, food stamps and government cheese. And I used to live behind a dumpster. It's like, I could lose a job in a heartbeat. It's like, so there's no job worth me doing something like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I have turned down contracts. I've, I've told people stuff that they don't want to hear. Not my problem. It's like, so, uh, and it's never going to be, it's like, they can't make it worse. It's like, I mean, my worst day now is better than my best day then. So sorry, mother, you, I've told my boss that once it's like, so it's like, that's the way I stand on it. It's like, I just, no, you can get a different job. You can't get a different soul. Yeah. Uh -oh. It's deep. Oh, 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 it's deep. Oh. Run. <laughs> um, I really like that you mentioned the idea. Uh, as much of us don't like to talk with cops or deal with cops or be around cops, but the idea of informing potentially law enforcement, it's actually something that our firm has started to do after Gabby and Justin experienced what they did. What do you think of the fact that even in those contexts, we are all social engineers and we massage even that language. For example, we will not engage with local police, even if it's a local townie job, we'll actually talk to the stateies or the sheriff and we'll massage their ego. We'll be like, hey, you understand, like we can't talk to the locals because they might bowl with these cats. But like, if you don't communicate this at roll call, but like, just tell your chief deputy if you think they can be read in. And they love that. They're like, oh yeah, I totally understand discretion. And, and we also don't say we're going to break in. We say, we were contracted to trespass on the property, which like if push comes to handcuffs, someone's going to say something. It's like, oh, no, no, like sheriff so-and-so like, oh, they were read in on the project. But do you, do you think it's okay to play in that gray area and to massage egos, even while we're trying to cover our asses? Um, as a, I just don't like messing with the popo. It's like, uh, just, I mean, let's put. I mean, I used to work as a supplemental officer for a gang task force back in the nineties. Okay. Horrendous people. It's like, it's gotten worse. And it's like one of the reasons why I quit. Well, that and the, and the, and the bullet, but, uh, no, I, I'm seriously, it's not, uh, something I want to deal with because the authorities, the authority and the way that the, the police will respond is improportionate. And it's like, and let's face it, I'm a white guy. So it's going to be a lot easier for me than some of our other people that are trying to do that. It's like, but that doesn't make it right. That makes it worse. And it's like, so no, I do not trust the way that they do policing these days, the way that it takes two years to get a cosmetology license in Texas to cut hair for those lethal weapons called scissors. It takes six months to get a T-close certification for a police officer in Texas. And they got a gun. It's like, so I'm sorry, back in my day, I did uh, community policing. We got to know the people in the area. We got to show them. They got to know that I'm not there just to try to shoot them. I'm there to try to make it better, not be part of the problem. We don't have that anymore. It's like, so I'm sorry. I don't trust police officers on an engagement not to overreact and get a little upset and get their feelings hurt and throw me in jail, coal fire, and just because sore losers, because these sore losers aren't just going to like, you know, pout about it. They can shoot it out. I, I think like, I mean, we all, we all think about that, right? We carry the letter and we go, all right, well, when might go to jail today? So like, let me put this in my pocket. Uh, as far as like safety goes and dealing with law enforcement, I think the, like one of the times that I was the most concerned. Um, wasn't when I thought law enforcement themselves would be involved, but when private security was involved, um, we were doing a physical engagement in a very, very wealthy neighborhood, um, in the LA area and they had private security and there. And like, so we checked them out, you know, and they had like what I can only describe as a movie trailer about how awesome they were on their website. It was insane. Um, and I was with two, um, you know, junior testers were with me and I was like, normally, you know, when you're on engagement, you'll try to talk your way out of something. You'll try to find your way out of there or whatever. And I'm like, that's not today. Like today, if something happens, you lay on the ground immediately and put your letter on your back. Like that's it. Get your letter, put it on your back and lay down. That's it. We die today if Barney Fife decides that he's got a, you know, a chance to do something. And I'm like, do not give these guys an opportunity. Like just lay on the ground. And be careful. I 
the letter out. I uh, this reminds me of a story I've used it in the talk before. Where in 2000 I was doing a, an assessment and I was coming out of the dumpsters. It's like spend a lot of time in dumpsters, and I'm coming out and I'm all happy because I got uh, the blueprints for the bank that they're working on. And if you're new banking, you know blueprints are pretty nice to have. It's a good trophy. And so I'm about to get out of the dumpster so I can do my happy root dance. And it's like all of a sudden I see these blue and flashing lights. I'm like, I didn't ask disco lights for my happy root dance, but I'll take it until I hear these two cops uh, open up their doors. And this one, it's like, he had to have been a rookie, man. Cause he was like screaming the, it's like, let me see your hands, let me see your I'm in Texas, I could die. And so it's like, so I'm like, I'm just reaching into my, I'm like literally showing them my butt because it's like, I mean, it might hurt less. It's like they shoot it there to pull out the letter. And it's like, and then I try to sashay over to the guy who doesn't look like he's about to kill me immediately. It's like to hand it to him. And then the guy looked at it and glanced at it. And it was like, oh, they're doing some kind of security thing. It's all good. And just like, oh, and that's when I realized they didn't check for a number. They didn't call the number that was on there. They didn't check any kind of verification. And that's why every engagement now I carry a forged get out of jail free card with my people's information on it and phone numbers. It's like instead of the other people, because that's been very effective as well. And that's why when I commit actual crimes, I carry a fake letter too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pro tips, you're only going to get them here. All right, that's it for our questions. A round of applause for our steam panel. <laughs> Alex Drifter, Jason Corgi, thank you so much for spending your evening with us. I have somewhere in my pocket of tricks, receipts, and our challenge coins. If you could pass those down or just take them all. <laughs> that is so true. You saw I gave out four. <laughs> uh, thank you again so much for joining us and helping uh, talk about the legality, ethics, and morality in social engineering. Thank you everyone for attending, for participating. Have a great night. And the fellas born up and that's the big man.